Hello, everyone. Welcome to Acadian Authors Night. Please take your cell phones, throw them away. <laughs> Turned off. Good. My name is Darren Collins. I'm the president here of the College of the Atlantic, and my only role tonight is as MC to keep the train running on time. Not to be cute, but to keep the train running on time. And that's going to be really hard. But I am very excited uh, for our 10 guests, 10 authors whose works span five centuries of time in Acadia National Park. And to start us off as an introduction, I'm going to welcome David McDonald, president of Friends of Acadia. Thank you, Darren. Always a pleasure to share the program with you. And just to be clear, I'm not one of the authors. I wish I were, but I am a great lover of books. And uh, anyone who has been to our house could see when you walk in the door, Caroline and I have books stacked everywhere to the point where it's hard to find a place to put the mail down when you come in the door. In particular, we love to collect main books, and then within that, of course, is our favorite section, which is books about Acadia and Mount Desert Island. And um, there's nothing I love more than sort of cozying up to that corner of the house. The only problem is I have not had time to do that lately. This, this centennial has been so lively and so uh, uh, all-encompassing for so many of us. Um, this event serves many purposes for me, one of which is to get reacquainted with many of my favorite Acadia authors. And, and I did a little check the other night. I'm very proud to say all of the authors represented here tonight are in our little bookshelf in that southeast corner of the dining room. So that feels good. Um, the authors represented here tonight really are doing all of us a great favor, not only through their inspired work, but in sharing it with us tonight in this, in this neat format. So thanks to Jack Russell for coming up with this idea in the first place. <laughs> thanks to College of the Atlantic for embracing the idea and running with it and executing it so beautifully. Darren and your team, thank you very much. And thanks in particular to, to the 10 authors for being here, for, for your work and for, for giving thought to how it um, is especially appropriate as we mark the centennial of Acadia National Park. So the fact that you're all here tonight really is a thrill for all of us. Friends of Acadia has been so gratified by the response to the centennial and the effort we've put into it. The community response has been overwhelmingly positive. And events like this just remind all of us how lucky we are to live here and be part of this park and part of this community. Um, we're particularly pleased that a couple of the books featured here tonight are projects in which we had an active role as publisher or a partner or a funder. So we're very proud of that and, and look forward to hearing from those folks. And we're just pleased that so many people are becoming more engaged with Acadia, giving back in their own way, volunteering on the trails, making a contribution, speaking to elected officials about the importance of Acadia in their life. That's what it's all about. And so the centennial has been amazing in that regard. And we're just a few days into Acadia's second century. July 8th marked the day on which President Wilson in 1916 accepted those initial deeds of conveyance and and issued the proclamation establishing Sir Dumont National Monument. So may we have as many inspiring uh, artists, poets, storytellers, historians in the decades to come as we have in recent decades. And, and thanks again to all of you for sharing your work tonight and all of you for turning out. Thank you. Before the program launches in and the authors come up, I would like to ask my good friend, uh, Jack Russell and Friends of Acadia board member and co-chair of the Acadia Centennial Task Force, just to see if I've missed anything, say a few more words to frame the evening from, from your spot in the front row there, Jack. Thank you.
Jack, just from all of us at the College of the Atlantic, I wanted to thank you for everything you've done for this evening and for this, this beautiful gift to the college. Thank you very much. Yep. You notice the large stick that Jack is carrying? That is to keep us on time. And the way we've organized this is we have, we'll hopefully have 10 authors here. Uh, each one will introduce their work with about 60 seconds of introduction, and then we'll have exactly seven minutes to read from a selection. And I know that seems a little ridiculous, but it's about keeping us on time having a, a nice amount of time to read and enjoy a piece of writing so we can all retire and celebrate together. So this, more, this evening we're starting with David Hackett Fisher. David is the Earl Warren Professor of History at Brandeis University. He's been on the Brandeis faculty for 53 years, an absolutely tremendous accomplishment of scholarship and teaching. He's authored 11 major pieces of historical scholarship, and these works have inspired both scholars and the popular reader alike, which is nearly impossible to do. His Washington's Crossing won the Pulitzer Prize in 2005. David is an emeritus board member here at the College of the Atlantic, and someone I consider a very spe special mentor. So please welcome David Hackett Fisher and Champlain's Dream. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm honored to be in the company of all the other scribblers who we will be listening to. Time is of the essence, so let me say, by way of my 60-second introduction, uh, that this uh, book, uh, Champlain's Dream, began here, this, in this room, in 2004, the 400th anniversary of Champlain's uh, first visit here. Uh, and uh, Steve Katona, uh, then president, uh, and, and Ed Blair uh, asked, I think I could say, ordered me to do a talk on Champlain uh, in that year. And I uh, thought of what had been written on this island or by island visitors, uh, by Francis Parkman, uh, uh, and then by uh, Samuel Lee Morrison, two big books on Champlain. And I wondered what I could add and then I got on the internet, and the materials just came pouring out. I had no idea how much had, was, was being done with Champlain all over the place. Uh, he has become a national, a world figure, uh, and uh, all, many new approaches are being tried. So that's what went into the book, and let me read a little bit uh, about the central themes uh, there. Uh, Henry IV, the Sieur de Mont, Champlain, all came of age in a very troubled time, in many ways much like ours. From 1562 to 1598, the people of France suffered through nine civil wars. Uh, there were uh, three million deaths in a nation of 30 million. Worse, these civil wars were wars of religion, with atrocities beyond imagining. I think I'd have to rewrite that today, uh, if, if, when, what we've been seeing. Uh, and those uh, civil wars grew into a general European war uh, and into a world war. These men, Henry and Sieur de Mont and Champlain, knew the worst of it. They were soldiers. War was their profession. They came to hate war for the cruelty and waste they had seen. They went to war on war itself, and in 1598, they won. They came uh, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, impose peace on France uh, by force of arms. They enacted the Edict of Nantes, uh, which established tolerance for Catholics and Protestants. And their Treaty of Irvine extended peace throughout Europe and even to the North Atlantic. These French soldiers began to think of a world at peace, founded on an idea that they called humanity. In that spirit, they turned to America, 
where many attempts had been made to found French colonies. All of them had failed. And Champlain was sent by his king on a secret mission to study the Spanish Empire. He reported back after two years that New Spain was a model of how not to found an empire, uh, and mainly because of the oppression of Native Americans and African slaves. Henry V organized an institute for advanced study in the basement of the Louvre. We visited there and saw all the places where they worked. Uh, and Champlain there made a plan for a truly new France where the French could live in amity and concord with American Indians. The key was communication. And the ship was sent to persuade two young Montanay princes, as they were called, to visit France, live with the king, learn the language, and go back and serve as translators. It was done. In 1603, a Pont Gravé, a friend of Champlain, uh, and Champlain himself, and these two young Montanay princes sailed to the St. Lawrence River on a voyage of reconnaissance, not yet of colonization. They an anchored in that wonderful little harbor of Tadoussac. Uh, and there, they stumbled on a great event that happened entirely by chance. Across the river, they saw a gathering of many groups, Montenay, Algonquian, Etchemin, and Champlain, and Pont Crevet, and their two young translators, crossed the river, entered the Indian camp without weapons. They were welcomed and invited to a tabagi, or tobacco feast. Uh, the two Frenchmen and these many Indian nations were able to talk through the interpreters. And they talked all night. And the following day, Champlain, who had great social stamina, invited them to go back across the river. And they had another tabagi on the other side. And they made an alliance between the French and many Indian nations that lasted for many years. Other voyages followed. Champlain and the Sieur de Mont came to the Gulf of Maine with another group of Indian translators. One of them was an Almushakwa woman who appears on many of Champlain's books and maps. They explored the Gulf of Maine uh, from Mount Desert to south, uh, 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 almost uh, in one of their voyages uh, to uh, Cape Cod. They met many Indians, a great many just in the Penobscot River Valley. And there were many more Tabajis. And in the next 30 years, Champlain made alliances, not formal, but understandings that lasted for, with 50 Indian nations, 50 Indian nations. The Mohawk were a problem. He went to war twice. And then he sent peace mess messengers. And he made peace with even the Mohawks for a period uh, of 20 years. Uh, years. But Champlain's most important role was something else, I think. It was in the peopling of New France. Uh, and for 30 years, he failed. In 1632, the population of Quebec was smaller than the colonists who'd landed on St. Croix Island in 1604. But Champlain kept trying. And in the last three years, 1632, 1635, at last he succeeded. Shiploads of young women began to arrive. Champlain uh, committed his own funds to subsidize families, marriages, homesteads, farms. He did it in four ways at, at once and with four different French populations. One took root in Quebec, mostly from Normandy. Another went to Acadia, and they came uh, from, uh, from Saint-Ange and from Poitou. A, fourth, a third was, uh, was mostly fishermen who came from Brittany. Uh, a fourth uh, were, the, uh, uh, were the, the Métis, the mixed groups of uh, French and Indian nations. Champlain had a meeting uh, in Quebec, and he told his Indian visitors that he had a dream that their children would marry the children of the French, and they would become one people. He supported Métisage, and all four of these groups uh, were different populations, they spoke different forms of French, a patois in each one, uh, and they created a history that has a great dynamic, not only for Canada today, but also in the United States, the fifth, depending on how you count, the fifth or sixth largest ethnic group in the United States are French, uh, and they are descendants 
from these groups that Champlain got started. And then just briefly, Champlain, after he did all these things, wrote another book about how it was done. And it was a small treatise on leadership in adversity, in adversity by a master of that art. Some of it was about treating others with humanity, enemies most of all, he said. But much of it centered on a word that has no English equivalent. The word was prévoyance. And it's usually translated uh, as uh, foresight, but Champlain meant something else. He meant a way of pursuing large pop purposes in a world where one didn't know what was coming next. It was a major of building big projects uh, when the future was very much in doubt. And he elevated this idea, not foresight, but forethought uh, into an art form from which we have much to learn. But still more engaging was the spirit in which Champlain did all of these things. Whatever he done, whatever he did was done with panache, uh, with flair and grace and high spirits. We have no English word for panache except panache. Uh, <laughs> even in adversity, Champlain acted with elan and with a clot. People of many cultures wrote about his joie de vivre, joie de vivre a passion for the pleasures of life, and his delight of the douceur de vie, the perfection of life's refinements, and for sharing them with others. All of that flowed from, from Champlain's humanism, and today they are his gift to us. Thank you. somebody else with a lot of panache, that gentleman right there. Next is Bunny McBride. Bunny McBride is a cultural anthropologist and an award-winning author. She's just finished a three-year term as president of the Women's World Summit Foundation in Geneva. Her anthropological writings span wide cultural and geographic ranges, from nomadic groups of the Sahara to the Maasai of East Africa, from the Sami reindeer herders in Scandinavia right back here to the Wabanaki. She's curated several major exhibits at her own Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor and also at the Rockefeller American Indian Art Collection. Please welcome Bunny McBride and a selection from Women of the Dawn. I'm so happy to be here, particularly because um, my husband and I recently moved back to Maine. And uh, in the past, when invited to speak in Maine, it was always a long journey from Kansas. And now I only have to come from Bath. So I'm happy to be here. Really delighted to be in the company of such um, a range of esteemed authors and delighted to follow um, David, who time-wise and spirit-wise really set up beautifully for what I'm going to share with you tonight. Um, the, just a brief background, Women of the Dawn traces the lives of four main Indian women, one from each of the last four centuries. And it begins in the 17th century with Molly Matilda. And during the colonial era, era she um, obtained a, a measure of notoriety in part um, in her diplomatic role as the daughter of the, a grand chief named Matakawando, and also as the wife of um, the French colonial officer and fur trader, Jean-Vincent Davidi, the Baron of Saint-Castin. Um, Molly Matilda grew up primarily um, in a seasonal village at the head of the Bagadouce River, and from, that's just west of here. And from there, it was just a short portage to Egamagan Reach, whereby her people could um, access the islands in Blue Hill, Maine, in, in Blue Hill Bay, and also um, um, Mount Desert Island. So this was real stomping ground for them. Interestingly enough, too, if you follow her story forward, two of her daughters lived at Naskeg Point, and one, of, and one of them ended up at Bass Harbor. And her son, Bernard Anselm, who, um, as you described, he was one of the allies of the French. And he ran guerrilla operations from Hancock Point um, in Frenchman's Bay. So I'll be reading you a passage from her story. Originally, her name was Pityaniski, 
She was born about 1665 in a forest of pine and birch on the banks of the great Penobscot River, which flows down from the mountains of Maine's heartland into the Atlantic Ocean. Like other tribes living near the northern Atlantic seaboard, Penobscot River inhabitants were called Wabanaki, people of the dawn, by their inland neighbors. For each morning, the first sunlight on the continent belonged to them, and they belonged to it. For they believed that Kisus, the great sky fire, was the ultimate spirit power in a world in which everything was imbued with sacred force. During the summer, daylight came early, stayed late, and transformed the rugged region into a land of plenty. The season's bounty enabled scattered individual families that had spent the miserly winter months inland to come together in large coastal encampments of a hundred or more people without fear of exhausting resources. Pityaniski's people often summered with others at the tip of a wooded peninsula embraced by the Penobscot and Bagaduce rivers. From the shore, the land rose gradually to a ridge that overlooked the vast mouth of the Penobscot and its scattered offshore islands. The Bagaduce, a more modest stream, curved around the peninsula's southeast flank to join the Penobscot as it poured into the ocean. Beyond the Bagaduce rolled spruce-covered hills backed by the heroic silhouette of bare granite peaks on Pemetic, Mount Desert Island. Some days, the mist rolled in from the sea, weighting the air with damp, salty scent and blotting out landmarks. Other days, the air held a blueness so clear that it looked as if it might shatter, and so it did when shifting winds grabbed fistfuls of water and threw them against that crystalline sky. While camped on the coast, Pityaniski's father and other men fished, hunted seals, and searched the forest for giant white birch trees, the bark of which they used to make canoes that were light and swift. Her mother and the other women wove baskets and fashioned birch bark containers. With their children, they gathered fruits, roots, nuts, and shellfish, and prepared smoked fish and dried berries to be stored up for the stark winter months. While working, they chewed spruce gum, which was used to caulk canoe seams and which kept their teeth white and strong. Throughout the warm season, Penobscots did much socializing, celebrating the bond of their extended families and renewing friendships with people from allied clans. Each clan was named for an animal, such as the bear, beaver, whale, or eel. For young people, the summer months at the coast offered romantic possibilities, not only with Penobscot River Valley inhabitants from different clans, but also with members of various other Wabanaki tribes who were part of their wide social world. Pityaniski's parents, hailing from opposite sides of the Penobscot River, met during such a summer gathering. Her mother was an Abenaki, from a chieftain family on the Kennebec Valley, River Valley to the southwest. Her father was a Maliseet, whose band roamed between the Penobscot and the St. John Rivers to the northeast. A tall and distinguished um, leader, he was known for his bold and insightful decisions. As a young man, he had riven, risen to the position of chief in the Penobscot River Valley. As um, his marriage extended his personal ties to the Kennebec, and during Pityaniski's childhood, he became the Grand Chief of Maine's entire coastal area. Pityaniski learned to respond to nature's shifting moods as she and her relatives moved about seasonally to meet their basic needs. Each autumn, when frost paled the meadows and fallen leaves formed bright skirts around the trees, most Wabanakis departed from coastal lands. Paddling and portaging inland, they scattered into small family groups for the fall hunt. Men stalked prey and tended trap lines. Women skinned the animals and transformed the furs and hides into clothes, moccasins, and blankets to shield their families from winter's icy breath. Winter was so stingy that Wabanakis called January the moon that provides little food grudgingly. Temperatures plunged far below freezing and game diminished due to animal patterns of hibernation and migration. 
hunters wearing snowshoes and working with small dogs managed to chase down caribou and moose, cornering them in snowdrifts for the kill and hauling the quarry home on toboggans. Other sustenance came from bark-lined root cellars, which were stocked with provisions taken up in kinder seasons. Throughout winter's reign, Pityaniski's life centered on the hearth in her family's large birch bark wigwam. Glowing embers filled the air with quivering light and heightened the sweet scent of the hemlock boughs that carpeted the ground. Sitting upon fur blankets, her mother nursed the youngest child and showed Pityaniski how to mend clothes and embroider them with dyed moose hair or porcupine quills. Her father, crouched on heels by the fire, roasted chunks of meat or repaired his weapons. After nightfall, as Pityaniski and her siblings nodded off, the age-old murmur of singing or storytelling danced about the shelter. It mingled with smoke from the fire and tobacco pipes and drifted out into the frigid darkness through the, an opening in the peak of the wigwam. Pityaniski's grandmother told one particular story more often than any other. She always began the tale the same way. Long ago, just after the geese had flown north, the old one saw something odd on the horizon of the big water. At first, they thought it was a floating island or a great white bird, but soon they realized it was the fulfillment of an ancient foretelling, that bearded strangers would come to Wabanaki country in great sailing boats from the direction of the rising sky fire. You realize that each of these authors has a curriculum vitae miles long, and I could spend 15 to 20 minutes introducing each of them, but I've had to cut these intros to just 100 words each. So I've told that to all the authors, so they're, they're understanding I'm not giving them short shrift here. Um, next is Judith Goldstein. Judith founded Humanity in Action in 1997 and has served as the organization's executive director since then. And across those years, she has brought over 1,500 university students from all over the world together to learn about and to promote human rights, diversity, and active citizenship. From the time of her doctoral studies at Columbia, Judy has explored the process of immigration and diversification in America and Europe. Judy is also a scholar of the human ecology of Mount Desert Island. Please welcome Judy Goldstein and a selection from Majestic Mount Desert, Volume 2. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and um, in such honored company. So thanks to to Jack and to, um, to David and to Darren for bringing us all together. Um, this book, uh, Majestic Mount Desert, is a compilation of essays um, uh, on a number of subjects, all relating, of course, to the island. Um, the first one is called uh, Tragedies and Triumphs, and it's about the work of um, Charles W. Eliot and George B. Dore and John D. Rockefeller Jr. in founding um, Acadia National Park. Uh, there's an essay on um, landscape architects, um, Joseph Curtis and Abby and John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Charles Savage. There's an essay called um, uh, Houses, Cottages and Camps, Who Lives in What and Why? And then, that was lots of fun, and then also a, a, an essay on uh, comparing um, Newport and Bar Harbor, which is called Castles and Carriage Roads. Um, and the final one is um, an essay, a s short essay on Catherine Wasserman Davis, a memoir. So what I'd like to do is to read from um, an essay that was written in 1996, and it's called The Power of Landscape, The Landscape of Power. Few places in America have so enthralled its public as the mountains, woods, and coastline of Mount Desert Island. This landscape engages our emotions, 
artistic senses, historical quests, and hopes for permanence in a world of unstoppable change. These interests, expressed through art and literature and historical works, ranging from the superlative to the silly, connect us more deeply to the island. We are eager to learn about the island's illustrious social history, to look at works of art and draw inspiration from this setting and to read fictional constructs that are nurtured here. These are pleasing manifestations of the power of landscape. How tempting it is to think about the island, both past and present, solely in pleasant cultural terms. There are, however, other compelling responses to this local landscape, which enlist powerful economic and political interests. These move us to shape, develop, and or preserve the landscape. These interests essentially matters of money and of control, engage and express social, cultural, religious, and political preferences. Competing claims to property and conflicting social tastes and political beliefs constitute the landscape of power. We tend to overlook this part of Mount Desert's important and intriguing history, or to think of it, especially its extraordinary story of landscape preservation, to speak of it or think of it in local terms. But this view is too limiting for both the past and the present. Conflicts over the American landscape intertwine and reverberate nationwide between this easternmost shore and the west. This is as true today as it was 80 years ago, or 100 years ago, forgive me, 100 years ago, um, when Mount Desert holdings were entrusted to the federal government as part of the embryonic national park system. This historic step caused several significant changes on the island. First, it joined the fate of Mount Desert landscape to the ever-expanding preservation movement in Washington, D.C. and across the nation, particularly um, in the West. Secondly, entrusting lands to the national domain gradually altered the island's dominant economic, social, and political preferences. Exclusivity emanating from summer colonies could no longer reign supreme. The history of Mount Desert's expanding, let me, to keep in time, let me keep, skip a, a paragraph. Today, many important issues about the Mount Desert landscape come into play within our democratic context. The most obvious ones relate to population pressures and explicit economic, social, and cultural tensions. Should we restrict the number of people who can use the park at a given time? How do we balance the need for privacy on the part of the island's residential communities with the economic enterprise of its commercial businesses? How do we reconcile the interests of numerous villages on the island? Should the public lands be exposed to invasive recreational use? None of these matters will be easy to work out, either on Mount Desert Island or, where relevant, in other parts of the national park system. But here on this island, we work to resolve them within our democratic system of competing interests and expectations. Beyond these inescapable problems, another order of political challenge has erupted in the West that affects us too. This one cuts deeply to our fundamental democratic commitments and beliefs. Several extreme right-wing groups now attack the legitimacy of the entire national park system. They challenge land holdings under the federal jurisdiction and a body politique comprising people of diverse racial, ethnic, and religious communities. The most ideological groups, the militias active in the West, now link the American landscape to tyrannical and racist views. Fortunately, these pernicious challenges do not readily appear on the political horizons of this island. But I would like to suggest that Mount Desert has a stake in meeting these threats, especially in view of our economic connections to the Western landscape. Armed with our mutual concern for the protected landscape and knowledge of a shared history, we can reaffirm our democratic values in the landscape of power. Thank you.
my wife Karen just turned to me and, and said, she wrote that in 1996. And obviously it rings true today here and potentially with the Maine Northwoods National Park, which let's see what happens. Next up is Ronald Epp. Uh, Ronald Epp's studies in philosophy and the classics led to professorships at the U.S. Naval Academy and the universities of Buffalo, Memphis, Hartford, and Southern Connecticut. Following his participation in the October 2000 Preserving Historic Trails Conference right here in Bar Harbor, his research interest shifted dramatically to the history and the remarkable life of George Doerr. Over the past decade, and through a close partnership with Friends of Acadia, Ron has worked tirelessly on creating Acadia National Park, the biography of George Bucknam Dorr. Please welcome Ron Epp and a selection from that tremendous piece of scholarship. Thank you, Ron. Good evening. I did not teach at Southern Connecticut University. <laughs> Correction. I taught at Southern New Hampshire University that many of you know through their rather gaudy um, distribution of online education these days. Part of the reason for my early retirement. Um, in 1985, uh, my wife and I moved back from Memphis, Tennessee to uh, the Connecticut River Valley. Um, that very same summer, uh, we were both then 42 years of age, we, Elizabeth tugged my arm and said, Acadia, Acadia, Acadia. Well, she had gone there with her parents. I had never been to Acadia. I was an enthusiast of the national parks. I had taught environmental ethics and the like. But the power of landscape, Judith, um, it got me. And um, being a philosopher, um, there is no Aristotelian mean in terms of um, questioning. Um, it, it is a kind of obsession with me. And so being from away, I asked questions about the origins of the park and probably got the kind of answers you would give and other people would give you. But what stuck in my gall was this disinterest in the father of the park in terms of what he brought to Maine when the family came here first in 1868 and then began to go and build Old Farm in 1878. So I understood the need for history to be rooted in uh, lots of different causal factors, but certainly motivational factors. So what were the motives that made this man what he became. So that took me back to Massachusetts, to Boston, to Park Street, to Beacon Hill, to the State House and the Commons and Jamaica Plain and the archives of too many historical societies at this time in my life. Um, and the result of all that effort was a, a, a lengthier bridge into my retirement than I ever anticipated. If you've ever crossed the uh, Chesapeake Bay Bridge, it's short by comparison with doing this. <sighs> Forgive the metaphor, mixed. Um, so <clears throat> one of the central features of Dora's wife, perhaps the central feature of Dora's wife, is this place called Old Farm. Um, many of you have visited you know about um, complaints that have been made over the decades about its neglected state. Um, I want to read you a little bit about how that place came into being. In the summer of 1878, Mary Dorr, George's mother, uh, wrote to a, an English family that had taken them in when um, George's elder brother um, died in the United States um, from typhus. Um, she still bore a heavy heart as she thought about returning home. She recognized nonetheless that her interests, hopes, and fears were as changed as if she had journeyed to some other planet. So during the fall of 1878 and the winter of 1879, 
The Dorr family was very involved in the building of their country home on a dramatic cliffside site in Bar Harbor. Their exp expansive property faced northeast to the mainland Goolsboro Hills across the long reach of the upper French borough, Frenchman Bay. They would name their estate Old Farm, recalling its heritage as an old farm during the area's um, agricultural heyday. During their early summers on Mount Desert Island, both the Dorr and Elliott families had made use of the accommodations of resident families. Still later in the 1870s, they had the option of staying at hotels that were being built. And shortly after, thereafter, the rusticators that they were pioneered a new mode of tourism. Of the architects who had submitted plans to Charles Dorr while they were abroad, Henry Richards, a son-in-law of Julia Ward Howe, was selected. Richards was not far removed from Mount Desert Island with his wife, Laura, and who would become a very well-known author, uh, and their three children, the family had recently relocated from Gardner, Maine, Boston to Gardner, Maine to help manage a paper mill owned by the Richards family. Eager to extend his limited success as a Boston architect, Richards began working closely with the Dorr family to execute his design of a large Queen Anne shingle style residence. The shingles hewn from California redwood harmonized with a warm reddish pink two foot thick granite foundation. The foundation, 132 by 52 feet, supported a year-round residence of 11,000 square feet. Imagine what that would cost today. <laughs> the first and second floors of oak and birch and maple contained more than a dozen rooms for family and servants, including six bathrooms. The drawing room, den, library, dining room, and bedrooms were outlined with new furnishings and familiar pieces from their Boston residence, including paintings by John Singleton Copley and William Morris Hunt. Doors third flo for floor, floor, doors third floor C room contained no more than 500 square feet, but it had a huge fireplace, a large window that looked out in Frenchman Bay and atop an oriental rug, rug door placed a writing table, an eight-sided pedestal table, and several walnut rocking chairs. Though he slept in a bedroom across the central hallway, it was in this study, surrounded by books, that his reflective activity took place. Within 10 years, the house would be electrified. That would be 1890. Easing the visual strain of late night reading, Town water and te telephone services were added to keep abreast of the times. A few feet away, there was a side porch with views of Champlain Mountain, where Old Farm's granite foundations had been quarried. Richards took keen interest in the architectural work and followed the project closely. Laborers on Mount Desert Island could be hired at this time for a dollar a day. Think about the $15 minimum wage now at Jackson Laboratory. Um, $3 a day for laborers who were skilled. Even so, the residential and landscape expenses were $70,000. If you do an inflation calculator, that's several million dollars in today's currency. During this construction, Charles, Mary, and George resided several hundred feet distant at Storm Beach Cottage. The 36 by 54 foot eight room gambro roofed clappered structure, which still serves as a park residence, was designed in 1879 by Charles Dorr to accommodate the family while Old Farm was being erected. Over its lifetime, Storm Beach Cottage would serve Dorr as Dorr's second home since Old Farm was frequently leased in the summer. During the winter of 1880, the Dorrs reside resumed their social life in Boston. Doors' memoirs contain no hit, hint that once established in the familiar social scene of Boston, his parents expected him to either engage in a career or marriage. Recently returned from the diversions of Europe, the Doors were now buoyed and, en and energized by their design and construction of their new summer residence. For the next decade, Mary and Charles, now in their 60s, 
would focus their lives on Old Farm and draw into it persons of substance, of substance who enriched their lives. Mary described her son in a letter to Rosalind Ho Howard <clears throat> as quite well, and he's, and he's been so since the first year after our return. He had been having visual problems. Specifics are not mentioned, but clearly the visual problems had persisted and the grief attending his brother's death may have led to a depressed state of mind. Yet now, after 13 years of illness and almost, and almost despair, the reward of all the waiting had, has come. She writes, his eyes too, the entire use of them, thank God, and he has been working hard ever since. The future of their only surviving son, however, was more determined throughout the 1880s by the actions of others than by the force of his own hand. And the dominant force continued to be that of mom. He would rise, it was the death of his father that empowered him to open the Mount Desert nurseries and the death of his mother to fulfill the words of Julia Ward Howe that, Miss George, get on with your life to a man who's 48 years of age. I remember those days. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ron, my apologies for the mix-up between Southern Connecticut and Southern New Hampshire, but it was strategically placed, actually, knowing that you would come back with a good jab at online education like that. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Carl Little. Uh, Carl came to MDI in 1989 after growing up in New York City and getting degrees from Dartmouth, Columbia, and Middlebury. Fine schools they are, yeah. He's the author of many books about art and about artists, and his 2012 monograph entitled Eric Hopkins Above and Beyond won the first John Cole Award for the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance. Carl directed the Public Affairs Office and the Blum Gallery right here at the College of the Atlantic uh, and in 19, in the, throughout the 90s uh, before joining the Maine Community Foundation as their Director of Communications and Marketing. His most recent book is co-authored with his brother David and is entitled Art of Acadia. Please welcome Carl Little and a selection from that work. Good evening. I'm honored to be part of this celebration of Acadia. COA is a fitting venue for this event as Jack Russell put it at an opening at the George B. Dora Museum of Natural History earlier this summer, no Acadia Centennial partner brings more energy and creativity to our celebration in so many forms than does College of the Atlantic. At that same opening, Darren Collins pointed out that Acadia has special properties, that it is what he termed a thin place where the physical and the metaphysical exist in close proximity. In Celtic Christianity belief, the thin place is a locale where the distance between heaven and earth collapses. Which reminds me of something the Belgian-born novelist Marguerite Yourcenar said in an interview in 1984. Madame Yourcenar first visited the island in the 1940s and eventually settled in Northeast Harbor in 1950. She wrote many of her most acclaimed works while in residence and in 1981, she was the first woman admitted to the French Academy since its founding in 1635. She told her interviewer, if I lived in an apartment in New York City, I wouldn't know a tenth as many people as I know here on this island in Maine. The sea brings in fresh air. You feel that you're standing on the border between the human world and the rest of the universe which reminds me that Acadia is a land of borders, both visible and invisible. The Mount Desert Island Historical Society chose the Acadian borderland as the overarching theme of the 2016 edition of its journal, Chibaco. In her introduction, Virginia Mellon, the society's outreach coordinator and a COA graduate, explains, in the most basic sense of the term, borderlands are physical or figurative places where different peoples and perspectives meet. More than a place to be passed through or an edge to be traversed, a borderland is also a center 
where interactions take place and stories unfold. Which reminds me of the late Sherry Gélin, a wonderful raconteuse who once hosted amazing evenings of storytelling here in the Gates Center. She taught the Greek myths at the Mount Desert Elementary School when my children were students there some 20 years ago. Sherry told the tales with such vivid detail that when my son found himself kayaking one day between two rocks along the shore of Echo Lake, he said without thinking, Scylla and Charybdis. <laughs> Which reminds me that Echo Lake is a part of my heart. Its soothing waters, the kingfisher that frequents the shoreline, snapping turtles sunning on rocks, and the loons. At the end of a tribute to that remarkable bird that aired on National Public Radio a few years back, the novelist Roxana Robinson touched on how the loon's haunting call may transport us elsewhere. She said, I lie in bed, the windows wide open, and listen to those gorgeous dreaming cries, that sweet opening into another world, and there's nowhere on the planet I'd rather be. Which reminds me, when my, when my brother David and I solicited images for our book, Art of Acadia, we asked artists for a short statement about their sense of place. One of them, Bar Harbor-born Sarah Farragher, wrote, Acadia is imprinted on me as a standard of beauty. Among her favorite places to paint is Skudik, whose bedrock, she noted, corresponds with the home I build for myself when I paint, the ephemeral spiritual home that goes where I go, and yet at the same time feels like that bedrock so firmly underfoot. Which reminds me of one of my favorite evocations of the transcendent Acadia, Elizabeth Coatsworth's poem from Cadillac Mountain. So might a Chinese sage have seen the world, seen mist and humpbacked islands from a mountain with a hawk hanging in a silver sky. So might a Chinese sage have seen his heart and its tranquility shown in elements of earth, sky, water, the only fire, white fire of the sun. Here the wind has come from far away, unhurriedly traveling from plains and forests, nameless lakes to seek the ocean and new hemispheres. The mind, stiffened with routine, stretches, floats off with the mist, off with the quiet wind to undefined horizons of its own. Which reminds me that many years ago, I wrote to Coatsworth's daughter, Kate Barnes, Maine's first poet laureate, to ask her about the circumstances of the creation of this stunning poem. She remembered driving up Cadillac with her mother when she was in her teens. I had never seen anything like that divine confusion of light and matter, she wrote. Which reminds me, finally, of Soames Pond and the marvelous visions that happened there. While not officially a part of Acadia, I've always thought of it as an island treasure with its own guardian, the Somes Maynell Wildlife Sanctuary. One day last summer, while driving to an appointment in Pretty Marsh, I pulled off the road on the backside of the, uh, of the pond. The sight of pickerel weed set off a Proustian sequence of memory synapses, which led to this poem, Pickerel Weed. I know these two from the pond I skirted as a child the green cake knives clustered along the shore, doubling in shallows, where I cast the hula popper, hoping the weed's namesake might snatch and tug the line into nearby lily pads. Oh, lovely slime of thrashing fish. And now I find them again, the weeds in a corner of Soames Pond, spiking the air while water bugs scurry among stems. They hold the pose through summer a few blue blossoms adding to the thrill, part of an overall green that we greet with affection after a long winter. Elsewhere, water lilies are more prominent in the landscape, but haven't a clue about the subtleties of beauty. Weed, yes, but such an exceptional one, cutting the air this way and that in a light breeze that animates us all.
Which reminds me, I need to, to fix that step there. Um, thank you, Carl. Next, my fly fishing partner, Bill Newland, and a life trustee here at the College of the Atlantic. And although he's written all his life, his first career was as a foreign service officer in Paris, Guatemala, Brussels, and finally as consul general in Nice. Bill's been tromping around the freshwater environs of MDI for 70 plus years, which led to the first printing of the Down East Guide to the Lakes and Ponds of Mount Desert in 1987. The second edition of that book was the result of a seminar here at COA with COA students and co-taught with College of the Atlantic faculty member Ken Klein and has the, dis the distinction of being the first book published by the College of the Atlantic Press. Please welcome Bill Newlin and a selection from the lakes and ponds of Mount Desert. To Pop, who loved these waters. Dad surely did love these waters. That was the dedication of lakes and ponds. But he also loved the ocean, and uh, he loved sailing. And when the weather was fair, the Newland family would find itself, along with its many neighbors in Mount Desert Island, on the water, which was a euphemism for sailing uh, on the ocean. But when the weather turned foul, and it got rainy and foggy and windy, it would chase some people inside. And what it would do with the Newlands, it would tend to chase us into the interior of the island to the lakes and ponds. Now, fishing was part of what we liked. But for me, at least, a very big part of it was that I just felt so much closer to the natural world in a little teeny boat on a lovely lake. So when I came to think about retiring from the Foreign Service, uh, I thought what I might do, and I thought I could write a, a book about the lakes of Mount Desert, and that would give me a project. And that was such an appealing prospect uh, that I went ahead and retired from the Foreign Service, and I, uh, I took care of my project. And it worked all right. Uh, Downey's book published it. And in the fullness of time, it sold out its very modest run of 4,500 copies. And I thought, there, that's, that's over with. Until Ken Klein came to me with a wonderful proposal. He said, I've got a handful of students who want to put lakes and ponds into a second edition. What do you say to that? And I thought it was a neat idea. And we did, as Darren says, teach a little tutorial. We put it into a second edition. College of the Atlantic Press published it as his first book. And I'm here tonight. <laughs> I'm going to read you a little bit from the introduction of Lakes and Ponds. And then I'm going to read you a little bit about Sergeant Mountain Pond. I need more light than I've got, but it's going to be all right. The lakes and ponds of Mount Desert, many, even the largest, locally called ponds, get short shrift. Ask most visitors to Mount Desert what attracted them, and they will talk about the waves beating against the granite coast. Few will mention the very special feature of Mount Desert, its fresh water. Yet, there are 25 lakes on Mount Desert and over 40 streams large enough to rate a name. Why, then, is the fresh water of Mount Desert relegated to the role of scenery only? It's because Mount Desert is blessed with an embarrassment of riches. Most of what Mount Desert has to offer is unique, or nearly so. Therefore, the merely unusual gets bypassed. Yet early writers about Mount Desert saw the lakes as the jewels in the island's crown. Uh, in his 1929 book, Scenery of Mount Desert, Edwin Race declares flatly, the lakes are the most attractive feature of the island. My thesis isn't that the ocean shouldn't be a major focus of your trip to Mount Desert. Tidal ponds provide hours of fascination. 
Their boats for hire, complete with captains to take passengers whale watching and fishing and sailing or to ferry them to other islands. These are delightful activities. You should, but, I, and I highly recommend them. I only hold that when picking your day's activity, you should consider the lakes as well. I believe a vast majority of visitors to Mount Desert Island, and I count among these many longtime summer residents uh, in this category, they do not make the most of what the lakes have to offer. That's from the introduction. And now let me read a little piece about Sergeant Mountain Pond. From my point of view, Sergeant Mountain Pond only has one flaw. I count its relative inaccessibility as an asset. <laughs> it doesn't seem to have any fish. It looks so pristine and fishy that it was only after many visits at many times of day under many different circumstances that I reluctantly concluded it was troutless. I was sure this was a problem that because it was spring-fed with no inlet or outlet, there was no way for the little fellows to have gotten started. Happily, that seemed like a soluble problem. I myself had carried home from the tropical fish store small containers uh, in little plastic, little plastic sacks with fish in them. The same principle would surely work for little brook trout if we just used larger plastic bags. <laughs> it was worth a try. What you need for this kind of a folly is a partner in crime. Luckily, staying with me at the time was one Donny Green, a guy who has never turned down a nutty product, project in his life. He, plus my wife Louisa and I, totaled three working directors. Supporting cast were available in almost limitless quantity, drawing on our own children, my sisters and greens. We soon had a half a dozen fisher haulers ranging in age from seven to 11. Armed with assorted trout fishing paraphernalia, packs and a bunch of plastic garbage bags, we set off. The most fun was catching the trout. Some of the other older kids, as well as the daddies, could ca cast a fly and Hadlock and Stanley Brooks provided cooperative trout. So before long, we were on our way up the trail uh, with our catch, nine little brook trout between four and seven inches. No one collapsed en route, and in due course, we had the satisfaction of slitting open our bags and watching our prizes swim off into the pond, seemingly none the worse for their journey. I would love to report to you that fishing at Sergeant Mountain Pond has been fabulous ever since. <laughs> but I must admit that to this day, I have never seen sign or even a little trail of one of those little trout, let alone their progeny. I now know that Sergeant is the most acidic pond on the island, and I will probably never see a trout up there. Sorry. Older and wiser, I also now know that introducing fish without permission is illegal. <laughs> More to the point, I have a much better idea of why that is so. Shortly after the first edition of Lakes and Ponds came out, I got a letter from a naturalist whose passion was dragonflies. After some polite and laudatory remarks about the book, he got to the real subject of his letter. He wrote that the profound alteration of natural insect populations that occurs on stocking or managing ponds. I, for one, he said, hope that fish never get established at Sergeant Mountain Pond because it would literally eliminate certain dragonflies that are particularly common there. I humbly stand corrected. Thank you, Bill. As long as it's not bass. Tr trout, okay. 
uh, Christina Marzangillis. She spent the last 28 years on two coasts, out in Berkeley, California, where she has administered the University of California Center for the Humanities, and then just southwest of Mount Desert Island out on Gotts. Her writing is intimately tied to place and also examines how individual histories intertwine with larger historical narratives. That's true of her work, Writing on Stone, which describes her Got Island house, the former childhood home of Ruth Moore, who was actually born on Gotts in 1903. Please welcome Christina Mars and Gillis and a selection from Writing on Stone. I may be the shortest person speaking here tonight, so I hope you can uh, hear me. Um, I am, first of all, honored and terribly pleased to be here tonight with this wonderful um, cast of speakers, all of whom, of course, are also interested in place, although uh, in, different, in different ways. But most of you, referring to Mount Desert, call the island. I have to call the mainland, and that is, of course, <laughs> as Darren has noted, because I live on Gotts Island. And when I think about and try to explain the role of time in our understanding of place, that place is Gotts Island. I live with the island's history, in part perhaps because I live in Ruth Moore's house, but not entirely. I live with the island's history and the the, even the presences of the families who live there. I feel I never quite get away from these presences, the Gots, the Moors, and others who have left traces and whose traces uh, we read, and I have tried to talk about that in my book. But at this moment, and again, on this great occasion, when we celebrate an, another historical event, the founding of the park as a special place in a special place, Mount Desert Island, I want to read a short meditation um, what I see as the important twin elements of time and imagination in our reconstruction of the history of place. And this is places that are special uh, to us all. This is from the prologue to, of uh, Writing on Stone. We tend to think of place in terms of location, fixity. Time and place, we say, as if the two were entirely separate. But removed from time, place tells us so little. In an aerial photograph taken in 1956, Great Gott with three neighboring islands floats amoeba-like in a black sea. Each of the islands is dominated by heavy spruce forests, dark gray splotches sparsely punctuated by small light patches of open land. Around each, but most noticeable on Great Gott, a bright rocky belt stands out in sharp relief against the darkness of the sea. Gotts, a mile across and three miles around, is irregular, almost unruly, a large bulbous shape attached by a narrow neck to a much smaller bulge at its eastern headland. But the boundaries ringed with bright granite appear to keep the island in place, secure, firm, and unchanging within the sea that commands most of the photographic space. Ruth Moore emphasized the independence of the small landmass when she wrote that the offshore islands, quote, belong to themselves, they stand in their own sea, end quote. But the photograph suggests relationships as well, island to island, dark forest to bright inhabited patch, minute building to broad and expansive surround of island-studded sea. Signs of the human are hard to find in the aerial image. No lobster boats ply that water. No island paths or tracks are visible. The caption on the photograph tells me that the existing buildings on Great Gott, quote, show clearly, most of them dating from the 19th century, end quote, but I cannot see those buildings. Only with help of a magnifying glass will I find my own house, a mere speck joining the others in the lighter space just to the west of the irregular dark that dominates the land, island. 
The stillness, the static quality of the 1956 aerial photo of the island leaves out the story of change. It leaves out history, patterns that in large measure explain the dominance of the dark spruce and sparseness of habitation. Before the forest in the aerial photograph, before the landscape that we know was the 19th century village. A few houses, like my own, remain. They sit squarely on their foundations of local granite blocks. These are the houses of the living, of the present. Sparse, stony traces, mere rectangles, are all that remain of the village, of the absent. We live in juxtaposition to those traces, and yet we're always surprised to come upon foundations half buried in seas of spruces. Within the density and gloom, it's hard to imagine that an open sheep pasture once existed here. Less than 200 years was their time here. Moore placed a time frame around the original island community that began in the 18th century, but could not survive the 20th. Like the photograph, she too suggests fixity, boundedness in time. What is gone is gone. But ever mindful of the world that was lost, we see the island as our place, too. I'm skipping a bit. In leaving out time and history, in depicting the island as complete and intact, the aerial photo leaves out narrative and the role that we ourselves play in constructing it. What appears as a clearly identifiable piece of land, a contained and supposed known, is also a place of the incomplete, the contingent, where the past still holds its power and fragments remind us of everything we will never know. The island, revisited again and again, is never entirely fixed. Place tells in its own particular way. It enables us to incorporate into our lives and into our language those we have lost and those with whom we still share a living community. A process of active making transforms absence, takes up the pieces, shards of memory, stories, experiences, and reforms them into a coherent pattern. Memory is self-affirming. We are what we remember, but it also engages us in a dynamic relationship with the place that makes the memory possible. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Christina. Ken Olson. Before coming to MDI, Ken Olson ran the Nature Conservancy's Connecticut chapter, American Rivers, and the AMC hut system in New Hampshire's White Mountains. He then came to MDI as the director of Friends of Acadia, where between 1995 and 2006, he created the first endowed trail system in a national park, co-developed the Island Explorer bus system, and helped build the tremendous organization we know today. Back in 2003, Ken worked with photographer Tom Blagden on the book First Light, Acadia National Park. And now, 13 years later, Ken's writing appears in Tom's second book, celebrating the Acadia Centennial, that's called Acadia National Park, A Centennial Celebration. Please welcome Ken Olson, and a selection from that book. Thank you, Tom. A small, a small correction. Uh, it was a, a wee group that um, got the Acadia National Park endowment established, making it the first national park endowed uh, with private money. And uh, a lot of people had hands in that. Um, I want to mention that the uh, Centennial is going very, very well, and congratulate Jack Russell and Cookie Horner. Uh, Jack's here, I don't know if Cookie is, but they won Friends of Acadia's uh, award, the highest award, the Marianne Edwards Award, uh, back on July 8th. Well, well done, both. And also, they're being uh, feted again at the uh, soon-to-be-held uh, annual meeting of the uh, Maine Coast uh, Mission. And Congratulations again for that. It's great to see this kind of recognition going around. It's a great celebration. Um, this book is a this book is a wee book as well. Um, 
uh, David McDonald, I think, cut himself short in saying that he wasn't an author because he is, in fact, uh, a co-writer of uh, our book, which is called Katy National Park, A Centennial Celebration. And uh, that book is primarily authored by the wonderful photographer Tom Blagden, who's in the audience. And the other writers are Sheridan Steele, the former superintendent just retired of Acadia National Park, Chris Crossman, who is the uh, former um, executive director of the Farnsworth Museum, Dayton Duncan, whom you may know uh, by name anyhow, is the writer for the Ken Burns National Park series, uh, Christopher Camuto, who has a wonderful book called Time and Tide in Acadia, uh, and David Rockefeller Jr., who wrote about his family's involvement in this. My essay, um, one more thing before I uh, go into it. Uh, there's a contest coming up related to the word, as Jack has uh, reverently referred to it, uh, called 100 Words for Acadia. And it is sponsored by Friends of Acadia, Down East Magazine, and the Main Writers and Publishers Alliance. You can go on the website called acadiacentennial.2016.org and find out how to enter. Anybody can enter. There are cash prizes and other prizes, and you've got to write up to 100 words of anything, a ditty, a poem, an editorial, a pan, a letter, whatever you'd like. We'd like to see them. There are three judges, and we will be as fair as we can. Um, I was, the title of my essay from which I'll read is called The Geography of Philanthropy. And um, I've had this title in my head for many years, having worked for a number of nonprofit organizations, because I see what conservationists do is really um, philanthropic in the root sense of the words philanthropy, the word philanthropy. Phil meaning love and anthros meaning mankind. So philanthropy means love of mankind and that's how this park was established and so many other things that are beautiful in Maine including Baxter State Park uh, and we hope, I think, the new national park to be established up in the North Woods uh, very soon. My piece starts with a an epigraph from Aldo Leopold, whom some of you may know. He is the author of what I think is the environmental book of the 20th century called A Sand County Almanac. And his phrase reads as follows, every privilege entails an obligation. The irony in honoring the creation of a national park is this, the honorees didn't create it. Acadia was made by other than us, we can cite an omnipowerful architect or credit geologic forces unconnected to faith or blend the two beliefs. Regardless, our species is mere recipient of a spacious geo-bioscape of salt water and mountains. Any asset dropped willy-nilly on inheritors requires they re-earn the gift or risk diminishing it while in charge. So it is in 2016 with Acadia National Park, a century old in law, at least 420 million years old by the clock. Lincoln at Gettysburg spoke of soldiers hallowing the battlefield by blood sacrifice. Such giving, he said, exceeds our poor power to, to add or detract from what they did. It's different with warless places. Though not consecrated in the Gettysburg sense, Acadia is dedicated ground and sacred to some. Present society's powers to enhance or lessen it are substantial and vie to cancel each other. I tell myself stewardship is winning, but outside Acadia, development has come a not so little cat feet and leveled its Cheshire grin at Mount Desert. More landscape consumption is inevitable. Acadia's founders foresaw it in the late 1800s and acted to preserve the island core, eventually by irreversible federal means. The summer colony had upper class roots and some of them uncommon wealth. They enjoyed political connections. Many owned the geographies in question. Perhaps these men and women could have convinced each other that their offspring would keep family lands undeveloped. Instead, though, the founders went visionary. They planned a future for Ile de Mont Désert, island of the barren mountains. They believed their power could add value to the lives of people they would not meet. The founders were philanthropists. Philanthropy, noun, love of mankind generally. Philanthropy thinks generations ahead, knows no discount rate, and assigns a high value to the future. In this case, the benefits of preserving the nation's boldest conjunction of granite mountains and the crashing Atlantic. Except in Alaska, perhaps, no other vertical national park is so profoundly defined by the horizontal sea. Maine's 3,400-mile coastline 
is a tracery of jagged fractals, headlands, bays, islands, forests, marshes, and bogs. But only Acadia has those features plus a complete mountain range condensed on an island. Eastward and south, within and beyond Earth's visible edge, the borderless Atlantic makes Acadia, including a park-protected skein of satellite islands, vaster than the eye understands. The brain, however, instantly reg registers big place. Because of maritime effects, the sea level and montane flora include Arctic and high elevation species. Our rocky summits top out modestly at 1,500 feet, but have a bona fide tree line. Ambient conditions can resemble those at 5,000 feet in the White Mountains or at 9,500 feet in the Sierra. The ocean is a raw master. The Atlantic is a roiling sea of inconsistencies, turbulent tides, placid tides, aesthetic profusion, carbon sump, storm generator, plains of desolation, protein mecca, frolic space, chemical catchment, eagle vector, fetid mudflat, sine curve wave factory, gene bank, glacial erratic deposit depository, dark tomb, froth and brine pool, museum of quartz veins and contorted schists, cancerous sun, the hope of cod, calcareous sands, astringent wind, lace foam surf, sucking undertow, basalt floor, beat up commons, seabird cafe, cacophony, predator banquet, euphony, salt mine, snail hideout, hideout, cetacean highway. Little is predictable beyond the timing of the tides. From terra firma, meaning summits or rocking chairs, we idlers can look seaward, sensing danger in the blue aqueous allure, knowing the mountains have our backs. Acadia is most mysterious when the ocean conjures a fog and shoves it inland, enclosing everything in eerie grayness. You might feel beads of mist by the molecule. The founders treasured the area as a physical entity, but also as a range of moods generated by contending forces, unrelenting sea versus unyielding land, obvious to all but the cynical or seriously ignorant Acadia was a place for the ages. Thank you. Just want everyone to know that in the Blum Gallery, which is right behind us, Tom Blagden's photography is on display now and it is spectacular. And the Blum will be open after we're finished with the readings and you can go have a look. And um, Tom is with us tonight, you can chat with him later. Our last reader tonight is Christian Barter. Christian is the poet laureate of Acadia National Park during this its centennial year. He's also work supervisor for the a and trail crew. So he's a poet trail builder or trail builder poet or both. Uh, he's the author of three award-winning volumes of poetry and his work has also appeared in Plowshares, Georgia Review, The American Scholar. And his work has also been featured on Poetry Daily, Verse Daily, the PBS NewsHour, and of course, Writer's Almanac with Garrison Keillor. Uh, Christian is a visiting faculty here at COA. He's held the Hodder Fellowship at Princeton and was a fellow at both Yaddo and the McDowell Colony. So to conclude our night, please welcome Christian Barter and his work from The Singers and In Someone Else's House. Thank you. Well, I'm reading number 10, and I will try to read these as interestingly as I can. These are sonnets, um, actually from a new work that I've been working on for a, a few years, um, which is set here, uh, here in Acadia, and uh, in some ways a very personal work. Feels almost a little bit like navel-gazing after hearing the large visions of the uh, writers before me, but such as it is. Um, and uh, this, it's a diaristic work that takes place over the course of a year in which a middle-aged man is asking himself questions about what he's doing with his life and a new uh, falling in love in, uh, in this time in which we live in. And this section, which uh, is set in 
2013 in the spring is called The End, and end is in quotes, and uh, its meaning to this work is um, ultimate goal. The End. Season of remembering, season of ghost limb pain, season of being basically young again, of being young at 44 or 60, of feeling 20 close enough to touch, Season you wake to a song gone 20 years and know it's time to tear the old barn down, play journey ballads all the way to Portland. This one life taking everything back, like Jewish museums reclaiming stolen artwork. Season it all means something again, what it actually was to fight fires in Utah or arrive in Princeton in a U-Haul at midnight, believing in something which is only a feeling now yet somehow has not lost one jewel of power. All week hiking in the empty park, the still closed roads laid down into their silence. They look like rivers looked at from the peak of Pematic. They have reached the deep calm of someone grown past waiting. Trill of wrens, the gull's horn blast, spruce limbs moved by the wind, not yet the push of cars pushing past all day, no engine groan that will soon fill these hills, like one long, drawn-out, imbecilic word. The woods reek of the life that precedes this one, and nothing has been lost yet, somehow, still, in this room we share with God, where days come back, brighter than this day's light, and loves come back, stronger, more certain, this time bringing a sword. I sometimes think the reason I write is simply that it puts me in front of the window, this window, on May 19th, when the first leaves have crept out onto these myriad branches like an army touching down overnight, that it makes me look up into the gently bent rafters of the pin oaks until I think rafters, the structure this actually is, coming known to me by whatever back door love comes while you're talking about work or politics, makes me hear birds' rich fragments stuttering at the prelude that this life can still, in spring, seem but to be, the day you must look for by looking elsewhere, that work being how we get to beauty. Wake to what we know. Forget the town a while. Forget career. You've got your apps in for a grad program. I shelve the manuscript I cannot publish and put my boots on for another year of staking routes and checking in on crews. This weekend we will tear the old barn down and have a few friends over for a beer and stoke the old boards to a midden heap. The questions of our life seem not so clear as do we have a child at the moment, that water muddied hopelessly by beauty. In any case, it's gone on break a while. The woods are doing all the work right now, and this life bends its thousand leaves towards light. Another host is talking about changing the conversation as though our culture were actually grown-ups conversing while outside the suddenly frail-looking oaks and birches are dusted in tiny leaves, are clustered by tiny leaves like the clouds around Earth and the satellite photos that show us how precious this blue ball is spinning in the abyss. The sky shovels its light into the forest, and the birds work fast as gunshots laying cover for the next of them, the source of their song. Is it simply that we've lived too long? Live past the age we know nature is everything, as all young people know, with the conviction of those who don't yet know they know something. I could go on about the rhododendron, pear blossoms, iris, blue forget-me-nots, loosening their fists of flowers on West Street, reeking of that life that precedes this one, or is coming next, or is otherwise the cruelest kind of joke. These houses holding the dust of 1890, still more character of man in one steep compound roof than all the crowds and gift shops, dazzling shards of the old god everywhere. Oh, I could lobby all day long for beauty as an end, in spite of all the shit that may come down, except that more and more I fear it may be, a gate we're not allowed to pass beyond. The conviction of those who don't yet know, they know. What was it, young, I thought I was going to do? Not just write, not just work in the woods. 
ride bikes with the only right woman down small town roads through loop and lace meadows slope to a foreign harbor as we did last week all day, read books, not just, not just. Can any life live up to the hype of the high young man, that carbon left from the industrial revolution? A raven calls his plaintive staccato, and the evening chirping begins all questions. We get what we want, but when the want is gone, and if I could wish, what would I wish for now? The same as civilization, to not have been young? Boy, this is really a downer I'm realizing up here. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, if, you, if you eventually get a chance to read the work, some of these questions do re resolve themselves, you know. Um, uh, okay, so this is the final one, <laughs> and it's a double sonnet, so here comes a double dose. This, this opens um, with a, a quote from Eliot uh, from the Four Quartets. If you were to come here taking the way you would be likely to take if you were to come here, taking the way you would be likely to take, through Ellsworth, Camden, through getting your teaching cert and taking a job at one of the schools here, through letting go, if you came like a flushed bride happily sighing, or like a sister blasting your adamant music, or on your bike freighting saddlebags over the cracked miles grim as Ulysses, or steering a swaying U-Haul up the driveway, brushing the low-hanging branches, the sagging wire, your books stacked neatly in liquor boxes, your grandmother's furniture wrapped in wool blankets, you would find me as you always do, of course, coming from the back room with my pen stuck in a Norton, when you wake up two hours after me, or sitting at the table with my coffee, talking back to the NPR report like a homeless person, telling Scott Simon to interview an actual Palestinian, or practicing scales on the couch, or pushing firewood, the difference being now, this is forever, not some prelude before the real sonata takes hold and rips your guts out with its passion, its new tonality, its modal shifts, this is it. It's funny. You thinking about moving here brings that decision I made years ago simply by living home. Thank you. So one one small island, 10 by 10 miles. And uh, I've come away from tonight saying, we are so, so lucky. Uh, so all nine of you, thank you so much for a, a beautiful evening. I would like to invite everyone to go out into the Newland Gardens to toast our authors and to toast the Acadia Centennial. Thank you. <laughs>